Good morning, everybody. How great it is that we can come and gather together, give thanks to our Lord for the weeks he's given us, and just bring him thanks and praise, as well as learning from his word. And we're going to start with his word as we hear some words from Psalm 89. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your, your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like him, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. The heavens are yours and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Your arm is endowed with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all that day long. They celebrate your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength, and by your favour you exalt our Lord. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. So let us rejoice and celebrate our God now as we sing together, Immortal, Invisible, God, Only One.
just a couple of notices for us. Uh, if you are going to be joining us for our Zoom meeting this evening at 5 o'clock, and I hope many of you are able to, uh, there is a sheet it would be useful for you to collect from me at the end. You don't have to do anything with it in preparation of later, but it would be useful for you to have it if you are joining us later. So uh, do, if you're going to join us on our Zoom meeting later, pick up a sheet from me at the back at the end. Um, I also have copies of Pilgrim's Progress for anyone that ordered a copy. Uh, we've had exactly 10 orders, which is exactly the number of copies I ordered, which is good. Uh, so do come and see me to pick up your copy uh, at the end. Now, um, we are... Turning off the wrong thing here. Uh, we are getting close to Easter now. Uh, we're in the period of Lent. Our Lent course, the old church's Lent course, starts on Thursday evening and we're starting to do some planning and preparation for Easter, thinking about what it is we're going to be doing, what times and where and that sort of thing. And as part of that, I kind of looked back over some of the things that we did last year. And one of the things that we did that was a little bit different last year is we decided to join with a sunrise service. And uh, I think most of us who were there really thought it was a great time to be together. And it was amazing seeing the sun come from nothing and growing more and more. And I was looking back at some of the pictures of that, and I thought they would be great to show you this morning, but we haven't got a screen. So I decided we would try and recreate a sunrise for ourselves. So this may or may not work. Kevin, could you turn off some lights at the back for me, please? I'm going to turn off some lights over here. Uh, and we, we start with uh, things a bit darker. Let's have a look. There we go. So I'm trying not to trip over here. I'm done. So hopefully you can still hear me that I'm getting in here. When we started, it was still fairly dusk and dark. You can make out some things, obviously, but there wasn't anything really to see. You couldn't see the sun. And then suddenly, uh, at one point, there was a tiny spot of light that appeared. And it's amazing, isn't it? When the things are dark, the tiniest bit of light suddenly becomes visible, and it was very noticeable. Uh, so ours is kind of slightly white and yellow. Uh, I remember it was quite a vivid orange when it appeared on Easter morning. So we start with that slight pinpoint of light, and then things, as time went on, things got slightly more. So that pinpoint of light changed into something slightly brighter, and we could see more of it. The light was growing as it went on and it kind of filtered out from there. And as time continued, the light grew until it became more and more and spread out, until eventually things started getting a lot uh, brighter. And you could see the sun very definitely in the distance, and it started growing so we could see that things were being lighted up and then it just continued to grow and grow and then until everything was a light and it was daytime. Thank you very much. And I think it was a great thing to remember on Easter morning because it reminds us of the effect that Jesus has in our world. In our service later, as part of our reading, we're going to think very much about Jesus being described as a light in a place of darkness. In fact, he is described as being a new dawn. And that's the difference that Jesus makes. Any light at all lights up a dark place. But with Jesus, things grow and grow until he illuminates things for us. He makes us live in light. But there's something very striking in our passage. It starts by saying people are living in darkness. But listen to what it says after that. The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. Jesus not only brings light, but he also brings life as well. 
I've had quite a few assemblies to do with light over the last month or so, looking at things, and we thought about all the things that light does. It helps guide us, it keeps us safe, it illuminates our way, and because of, I'm all about cross-subject uh, learning, we did some photosynthesis as well, uh, and so we learned that light also brings life. And of course, that is the great truth of Jesus. These people were living in the land of the shadow of death. But what happens with a shadow if we shine light on it? Can any of our people, young people tell us? Do you know what happens if we shine light on a shadow for this thing? What happens? Do you know? Sorry? Yeah, so we can see a shadow. But if I was to get my torch, and we've got a shadow by you, let's have a look. And if I shine my light on it, what happens to the shadow? It starts disappearing. The light makes a bit of the shadow the light is on disappear. So that's what Jesus does for us. He lights up the darkness, he gives us life and helps us. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That is the great promise we have when we turn to him. So let us give thanks to him now in prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you that you sent Jesus to be a light in the world. We do thank you for the difference he makes, how he leads and guides us, how he protects us, and through the light of his life, he gives us life eternal. Lord, we thank you so much that that is the good news of the gospel that we have and we can share. We thank you that your word is also called a light, a lamp for our path. And we thank you for the different ways we can come together and think about what is contained in your word and the difference it makes for us in our lives. So we thank you that we can join here together this morning. We thank you we can join in Zoom. We thank you for our prayer meetings or Bible studies that we have, when we can spend time in your word and come to you and bring the thoughts that are on our hearts to you. And we thank you that we can help shine that light for other people. And so we thank you that we can spend time with some of the younger people amongst us as part of Sunday School and Treasure Seekers. We thank you for the slightly older ones that we can spend some time together on Friday as part of our youth evening. We thank you for what well, is quite a few of the older ones amongst us on Thursday at B3A. We thank you that we have these times that we come together in different ways and it reminds us how you came for all people. Not just some of us who are one age or from one place, but you came for everyone to be a great one. And Lord, we thank you we can join with others that know the great truth of the light of Jesus. And we pray for these Lent, uh, this Lent course as it starts on Thursday. Lord, there's been lots of things that have uh, meant things haven't happened in the way we thought. We pray that none of that will matter at all. But what will be great is to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ and learn more about the importance of the Lord Jesus and the difference he makes in our lives. Lord, we thank you that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. So we thank you for each other, those people that are so important to us. We remember those people who are not feeling well at this time. We remember those who are known to us who are undergoing medical treatment. Lord, we thank you that you are with them and you can bring them comfort. And we pray that you also be bring them here. And Lord, we thank you that we have particular people we remember in the life of the church each week. And this week we think of Stephen Evans and Jacob Gibbs. Lord, we raise them to you, we thank you for them, and we pray that you will keep them very close to you and you will bless them. And Lord, in the silence we remember those people who are maybe particularly on our own hearts at this time.
But we're going to be thinking a little bit later on how Jesus came to preach and teach uh, people. And we thank you that one of the things he taught us was a prayer, as a model of a prayer we can say. And we thank you that that has been preserved for us so we can say it together. So uh, in our service booklets or online, we can share together in saying the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our next song, which we're going to sing just before our young people go out to their groups, reminds us that Jesus is a light shining for us in the darkness to help guide us and protect us. So let's sing together, My Light.
As hopefully you are aware by now, we have been looking over the last few weeks at the early life and ministry of Jesus as recorded by Matthew in his Gospel. And we're continuing with that this morning. So it's Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 17. Do please uh, read it through with me as I read it around two months. So Matthew 4, starting at verse 12. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come in. Shall we return to a time of <coughs> Dear Lord, although Many of us are very aware of the blessings that you give us each and every day. We are also aware that we do live in a land where there is darkness, the darkness of sin. Lord, we are so sorry that mankind took the perfect world you created and allowed darkness to enter. Lord, we are sorry for so many times when we turn on the news and we just see the evidence of sin all around us. <coughs> Lord, we, we pray for all those who are experiencing effects of sin, whether that is through things like <coughs> conflict or oppression or natural disaster or whatever it may be. We pray that they will come to see Jesus the love, the one who can bring true comfort to you. Lord, we remember brothers and sisters who are persecuted overseas. We pray for your strength, for, them, for your courage and zeal, and we thank you for their passion of just introducing people to Jesus. We pray that the seed they sow would gather much fruit. Lord, we thank you for them. And we thank you for those people that we are able to support as a church. We pray that they may know your encouragement. And they too will see the fruit of their labors. And that many people will see your love through their efforts. Lord, there are maybe things that concern us or just things that are happening in the world that we ask for your hand to be upon. We think particularly of the political changes that are uh, happening in China at this time. We pray for Xi Jinping, the president, and the changes he wants to make. Lord, we pray he would realise that you are the one who puts people in authority. So we pray he will turn to you for wisdom and will follow your guidance to you. Lord, we know that there are issues with relationships between some different countries in China at the moment, and we just pray you would bring peace to those things, that you would look for people to work together for the aid of one another, rather than for any other reason. And Lord, as we talk about relationships between countries, we are reminded yet again of the situation in Ukraine. Lord, again, we raise it to you. It seems astonishing it has already been over a year now since Russia entered Ukraine. Lord, many of us thought that was going to be something one way or the other, uh, one way or the other that was finished with quite quickly. But here we are a year later, still praying for the same things. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you again and again, and you still long to hear those things that are on our hearts. So we do raise the people of Ukraine to you. We pray you will continue to strengthen them to bring them comfort and to help them in their difficult times. We 
We pray for those in authority in that country, for the way, for wisdom, for the way they respond to different things. And we pray for those in authority in Russia, and very particularly President Putin. We pray again that he will change his heart and that he will turn away from the wickedness there has been so evident over these last 12 months. But Lord, this week in the media, it seems they want to particularly remind us of Bakhmut. How astonishing that before the conflict started, there were 75,000 people living there, and now there is only four. Our hearts break as we hear so many of them are living in shelters without access to gas or electricity or water. Lord, help them, we pray. And we thank you for those different organisations that are helping people in the country. And we thank you again for Ukraine Christian Ministries and the way they are able to support us. We thank you for the churches in Ukraine that are standing up and really helping people around. We thank you that many are seeing your love through them are coming to, and are coming to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for themselves. Lord, we continue to uphold that whole issue to you. Lord, as we think about people in authority, we pray for our King and his government. Again in the news, there's lots of things that could be distractions to them, and we just pray they will stay focused on what is important. We pray that they would, as we pray for others, would seek your guidance and continue to serve the country faithfully. Lord, I, many of us are concerned about the issue of migrants crossing the channel and we've heard our Prime Minister say what he intends to do about that, but Lord, there are many of us concerned about what he has said as well. So we just pray for wisdom in that situation. We pray that in amongst other considerations, there will definitely be the consideration of love and reaching out to those that are in trouble and who need our help. So Lord, just be in that situation. Guide and help us we pray. Lord, we thank you again for each one of us here that we can come together today and we can spend time in praise and thanks to you. But we thank you that we have the great gift of your word preserved for us. And we pray as we come to look at that in a few minutes' time that you will be with us and you will help it speak to our hearts. You will help us be attentive to what it says to us. And we pray exactly the same for those in some of this room this morning. We thank you for those who are taking the classes, who are leading them, and we do pray that that will be a great blessing to all those involved there as well. Lord, we do thank you for all you do for us each and every day. And we just pray this to the glory of your name, through Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Before we come back to our passage, let's sing again. Light of the world.
few things keep our passage Anne and I have recently enjoyed watching a few police or detective based shows on the television. And with what is currently showing on uh, different channels as well as what we can stream, there seems to be no <coughs> lack of different police or detective dramas that we could turn into and view. Well, one of the things that I've noticed over the last few weeks is that whenever anyone is abducted in one of these dramas, the abductee is often shown as being kept in darkness. I'm sure we can, well, actually you probably can't imagine actually how awful that would be to be in such circumstances. But perhaps we can imagine the hope we might feel at seeing some light come into that situation, thinking that perhaps someone has come to free us from what uh, we are experiencing. In today's, passing, we, uh, passion, in today's passage, we see a people who are described as living in darkness. In fact, what is called the shadow of death. But they are seemingly unaware. Unlike people maybe trapped in a basement somewhere, they don't know the danger they are in. But Jesus has come to be their light and hope for the future. We will start in verses 12 to 13 by seeing a new location. A new location. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. At the end of our last passage, Matthew told us that Jesus, having been tempted by Satan, was being attended by angels in the wilderness. But now we are jumping forward in time once again. Matthew gives us no indication of how much time has passed, but it's likely that these events don't completely follow on from what we were reading last time. Matthew tells us that Jesus has heard the news about John's arrest. He will tell us more about this in chapter 14, but he, want, uh, but he tells us then that Herod Antipas, the ruler of Galilee and Perea, an area beyond the Jordan, is the one who has arrested John. He arrested him because he wanted to have his brother Philip's right in the radius, and John said that that wasn't lawful. So Herod Antipas actually wanted to kill John, but he was afraid to do so because the people thought John was a prophet, so he settled instead, at least initially, for keeping him under arrest. It is, of course, possible that John's arrest happened during Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. But in his Gospel, the Apostle John seems to indicate that Jesus spent some time after that in Judea. After this, that is, Jesus teaching Nicodemus, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Aenon near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being, put in, uh, being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. John 3, 22-24. But now that John has been arrested, it is time for Jesus to move to a new location. And so we are told that he withdraws to Galilee. The word which has been translated in our Bibles as withdrew, in the Greek, is an anachorium. And interestingly, we have already seen that word several times in Matthew's Gospel. It was used, for example, of the Magi when they returned or withdrew to their country by another route. It was used of Joseph when he took Jesus and Mary during the night and left for or withdrew to Egypt. It was also used of him again when they withdrew to the district of Galilee upon their return. Some people have suggested that this withdrawing always takes place after opposition or threat, and that is why Jesus withdraws now, for his own safety. 
But we must remember that Herod Antipas is ruler of Galilee. And so that would be a strange interpretation. The author F. B. Filson has suggested that something else is happening here. He said, when Jesus went to Galilee, his move was an answer to Herod. He took up in Herod's territory the word which Herod had tried to stop by arresting John. He began his ministry with challenge rather than retreat. This would certainly seem to tie in with what lots of the other commentators feel that it's not a cause of John being arrested that Jesus withdraws, but it is just a time marker for us. But maybe there is something else that we should notice here too. So far in Matthew's Gospel, when Jesus has withdrawn, it has had the purpose of fulfilling prophecy. So, he, uh, firstly, out of Egypt I called my son, and then he will be called a Nazarene. And we will soon discover that once again, Jesus is withdrawing, will see a fulfilment of prophecy. But we will return to that thought a little later. Upon returning to Galilee, Matthew tells us that Jesus leaves Nazareth and relocates in Capernaum, which has now become his home. Although it's likely that this was much more just a base of operations to work for him, rather than a settled home life. Because Matthew later tells us, Jesus says, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Uh, chapter 8, verse 20. Capernaum was on the north-west corner of the Sea of Galilee and would have been a busy lakeside village. The province of Galilee itself is around 50 miles long and 25 miles wide. And the one-time governor of Galilee, Josephus, once said there was no fewer than 204 villages in the province. And none of those uh, villages had fewer than 15,000 inhabitants. So Galilee was going to be a very populated area. It also had several important roads, and Capernaum itself had a main trade route running through it. For several years, Anne and I spent uh, some of our holiday time in South Wales, being located near Abergavenny. And one place that we really wanted to go and visit was a small town called Us. Now it's quite a pretty town, it's boasts various things, it's got, a, it's got a castle, it's got a prison as well. None of those reasons were the reasons we wanted to go to us. The reason was very simple. It didn't seem to matter where we went in the south of Wales, no matter how far we travelled, every single place we went, we saw a signpost for us. It seemed that every road led to us. Something similar could be said of Capernaum or Galilee in general. In fact, it has been said Judea is on the way to nowhere, Galilee is on the way to everywhere. It may have appeared in some ways a very strange place for the one born king to move to. You might have expected to see him in Judea or in Jerusalem. But as we will see in verses 14 to 16, it did usher in a new door. So Jesus went and lived in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. I mentioned earlier that Jesus' withdrawing has, so far in Matthew's Gospel, facilitated the fulfilment of Scripture. And Matthew is keen to point out that that has happened once again. It is part of his bank of evidence he is building up to show his readers that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of David, the one that has been prophesied in the Scripture. And so he takes us to the words of Isaiah, and in this case from Isaiah chapter 9. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. 
In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor the Galilee of the nations. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of deep darkness, a light as dawn. Isaiah 9 verses 1 to 2. The land of Zebulun and Naphtali had indeed been humbled. They were the first part of the promised land that had fallen to the Assyrians when they invaded in 733 BC. Since then they had gone through lots of changes. History tells us that before the 2nd century BC they had spent 500 years in pagan hands and it continued to be a very mixed area in terms of who lived there. There was a Jewish proportion, but there were also many Gentiles that lived there. Isaiah was able to refer to the area as Galilee of the Gentiles or of the nations in his day, and if anything, that title was even more apt in Jesus' day. They had been in darkness after the invasion, but Isaiah knew that someone was coming to brighten that darkness, and that person was ultimately God's Messiah, God's chosen people. Look at what Isaiah wrote just a few verses later. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah 9 verses 6 to 7. Those words that we so often hear in the lead up to Christmas. As Matthew quotes from verses 1 to 2, he knows that context is key. And he wants his readers to also be thinking about verses 6 and 7. And see that the promised child is none other than the Jesus that has now gone to make his home in this area. When we look to the latter part of chapter 2, the prophecy that Jesus would be called a Nazarene, we said then there wasn't actually a specific piece of of scripture that that was fulfilling, but rather it was an image that was created through scripture of the suffering servant, the one who would be despised. And again this passage makes it very clear that that is the role that Jesus will fulfill. He is going to a place that is mocked by him. He is going to set himself amongst them. He is the one who once called himself the light of the world, and who said, I have come into the world as a light, so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. John 12, 46. <clears throat> but as Jesus brings light, he also brings life. In the way that Hebrew poetry so often does, repeat something that builds upon it. Isaiah takes us through saying that the people are living in darkness to the fact that they were living in the land of the shadow of death. That is the darkness that continually touches them because they are dead in their sins. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus and said, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Ephesians 2 verses 1 to 3. That is the situation that the Galileans were in. But Jesus came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. He is the good shepherd who is with us and guides us. So we can say, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, 
from your rod and your staff they come for me. But not only does the Lord Jesus bring us comfort, he brings us light. A new dawn that chases away the shadows and brings us life. As Paul continued to say, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 5. I once had a friend who we used to go and visit pretty much every Monday evening, and we would spend the evening either watching television or watching a film or listening to music or doing something else. But there was always an issue every week. As the evening wore on, it got darker and darker to the point where we could barely see each other. But my friend never seemed to do anything about it. It was almost as if he hadn't noticed the darkness there was. The rest of us were craving for lights. But he only seemed to be aware of how dark it had got when someone eventually switched the light on. That is the situation that Isaiah describes these people were in. It's the same as Matthew describes them. But unlike the abducted, trapped in the basement that we thought about earlier, they, like my friend, were oblivious to the darkness they were in. The situation of being touched by the shadow of Friends, doesn't that sound like so many people today? They continue on in their lives, living for themselves, living in darkness, with a future of death hanging over them. But they live as if that isn't the case, because they just can't see it. They may have noticed the darkness in others, they may have noticed darkness elsewhere in the world, more generally, but they don't see that they are in darkness too. They will only come to see the truth when the light reveals it to them. That is why we should reach out and help introduce them to the light of Jesus. We want him to illuminate their darkness so that they come to both understand and promise that great promise of Jesus. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. John 8, verse 1. Jesus came to give people a new dawn. So that is why we see what we do in verse 17. A new ministry. A new ministry. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Over the last couple of chapters, we've seen John prepare the way for Jesus. We've seen Jesus be commissioned for his ministry through his baptism and then the alighting of the Holy Spirit on him. We have seen him tested to show that he is the Messiah, the chosen king that God wants, the suffering servant who follows the will of the Father above all other things, even in humility. And now we see Jesus withdraw to Galilee and Capernaum, so he is now ready to start the ministry that his father has prepared for him. This is said to be one of the turning points in Matthew's Gospel. Jesus may have previously wanted to associate himself with John's ministry, being baptised and baptising others. But now he has moved out of the Jordan and he is starting his preaching and teaching ministry in Galilee. It is a ministry that will be heard by Gentiles and it looks forward to the time when Jesus will send out his followers to be there his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations just as we thought about last week. It may be a new ministry for him but we have certainly seen the message before. It is exactly the same words that were recorded for us that John preached in chapter 3, verse 2. John truly was preparing the way for Jesus. When we looked at John's ministry, I said it would be interesting to see all the things that John said that Jesus later picked up. 
And this is the first example we see of it in Matthew's Gospel. We're going to be looking at some of the others of those occasions tonight in our Zoom gathering to see what that means for us. <laughs> With Jesus, a light has dawned and the kingdom has come near, so people need to repent, to turn their lives around and live following Jesus. They need to show the fruit of repentance, but not depend on their actions for their salvation, but rather on the grace of God, which comes through his Son, the one born King, the suffering servant, Jesus Christ. The importance of Jesus' preaching ministry is clear throughout the Gospels. After Easter, we're going to be spending some time in part of that ministry, the Sermon on the Mount. And Matthew devotes three chapters of his Gospel over to that one sermon. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus has been teaching but also doing some healings. But then he says to his disciples, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he travelled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Mark 1, 38 to 39. To bring people from darkness into the light, people need to hear that message. Repent, the kingdom of God has come near. Because it makes all the difference. In the book of Revelation, when John sees the 144,000 sealed as servants of God, it includes 12,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and 12,000 from the tribe of Zebulun. It is the only other time those tribes are mentioned in the whole of the New Testament. Of course, then he sees the great multitude that no one can count from every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the Lamb on the throne in worship to him who brought their salvation. I truly hope that each one of us here have experienced that light of Jesus for ourselves and that we continue to walk in that light, having it on our hearts to introduce that light to others and the good news that Jesus brings. But maybe you are here this morning and you don't feel that you've ever experienced that light. You haven't seen it for yourself. You may not have realised it, but you are still living in darkness, living in the shadow of God. Then look to Jesus. Let him illuminate your way through him to your heavenly God. Through him to ultimate comfort and hope. Through him to your salvation and eternal life. Shall we pray? <coughs> Dear Lord, how we thank you that Jesus was sent as a light to all people to illuminate the way to you and give us the promise of an eternal future with you. Thank you that through your Holy Spirit you have revealed that light to us and have called us to help reveal that light to other people. Please help us to continue to walk in the light of Jesus all the days of our lives, using your word to guide us. And how we look forward to the day when we will dwell with you in powerless, and we will not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because your glory will be the light, and Jesus will be its light. It is in his name that we give you thanks and give all glory to you. Amen. So let us finish by singing together. Walk in the light.
do hope you'll be able to come and join us across in the church hall for some refreshments. And just a reminder, if you are able to join us at 5 o'clock this evening uh, on Zoom for our Sunday evening gathering, do see me and pick up a sheet for that. Also, if you order a copy of Pilgrim's Progress, see me and I'll be able to give them to you. The Apostle John says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing round the throne and round the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever.